son had mentioned that um, I'm with Toronto Rehab. Yes, I, I, I am. I'm an affiliate scientist there, but I do need to acknowledge um, who actually pays my bills. So um, I'm actually faculty at the University of Toronto in the Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy Department. And um, while I do have close associations with Toronto Rehab, um, I do have to um, make that uh, update. So um, it is my absolute great pleasure to be here um, leading this uh, second panel, um, looking at how healthcare ro robotics can be used to support independent living and therapeutic goals of patients. And uh, with this uh, panel, um, similar to um, the panel that Animesh led uh, uh, just now, um, it's going to be kind of freewheeling. Um, so we'll have, um, you know, so, um, we're going to go with the flow of the conversation. Uh, we will have, um, you know, I've got some questions um, set up, but I also do want to um, reserve some time uh, for uh, the audience to um, uh, ask some questions as well. And uh, because we're there, there's only two panelists here, um, I would just like to also offer that uh, the panelists can ask each other questions as well as uh, they come up. So um, I'm just going to start off with a very brief uh, introduction of who we've got um, in our panel here. So first off, we have um, Ron Bellino, who is an advocate and a caregiver. So he's waving his hand. Excellent. And um, so Ron is also newly um, uh, minted as a HL Honorary Fellow for 2020. And so it's a great honor um, to have him uh, be a part of our panel today. Um, he is an active advocate for dementia, caregiving, aging, and research. And um, he was also a caregiver for his father who lived with Alzheimer's uh, disease for over 10 years. Um, um, and supporting him and his goal to age in place. Um, and so Ron has in his um, support of his family um, used technology, uh, leveraged the community and um, made access to research um, that was available uh, to support his family and his father in particular to live as best as he, as he possibly can. Um, and Ron has done lots and lots of presentations um, in different um, university courses, but also in um, lots of different spheres in research around the world um, related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, also with, um, you know, areas around um, uh, community support, uh, policing as well, and um, supporting people to live um, as safely as possible with uh, dementia. And of course, he's a caregiver and so he's a big advocate for for caregivers as well. Um, next up, we have Milad Azida um, Azadeh, Ms. Rahi, Meg Razi. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hopefully, Milad will correct me um, uh, in my horrible pronunciation. Um, Milad is the Vice President of Research Development and Partner Integration at Mayant Inc. And so a really, really awesome company that is based out of um, Ontario here. And uh, Milad is uh, a U of T alumna, alumnus. And so um, he graduated with a Bachelor of Applied Science and a Master's of Applied Science um, in Mechanical Engineering and the Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering. Um, he worked as a research engineer at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, um, where he collaborated with physicians and therapists um, and other researchers looking at um, primarily neuromuscular and skeletal issues um, after spinal cord injury, um, and also with um, patients uh, who've had a stroke. And so right now, he oversees the research and development efforts at Mayant, and um, uh, his vision um, in his role is to continue this path and make accessible uh, technologies um, uh, that are able to spread from academia through to research and to um, everyday use. So without um, further ado, I'm going to um, present my first question, which will also give you an opportunity to get to know our panelists um, in their own voices. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask is, um, how is robotics a part of your daily life or work? And um, what thrills you about your work in this field? So maybe let's start off with Ron. Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. And thank you, Rosalie, uh, for uh, the introduction. Uh, thanks as well to you and Kimberly for uh, inviting me here today. Um, hopefully, um, many of you have Zoom set up so you could see our full faces. 
okay? Because I know you guys were talking about how Zoom could be boring. I'm going to change it up a little bit here. I'm actually going to add a little bit of uh, technology here. Can you see that beside me on my screen? Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to be showing a, a little bit of a, a history here because uh, Rosalie already gave us a couple of warm up questions ahead of time. So I kind of got, was able to prepare. And I have to usually start with the story of how I got into robotics or just my interest in robotics. Uh, because years ago, um, my first robot was back when my grandma gave it to me back in the Philippines. And it was called the Volta Spy. Okay, that's what it is right there. Okay, my first concept of a robot, it was when I was visiting in the Philippines and uh, I was about maybe six years old and uh, just fell in love with that robot. Now, I'm speaking to all of you coming from the perspective of someone that's not in engineering, that's not around robots the way you're, you're around it, okay? But I also come from a little bit of an engineering background, but that's not the hat I'm wearing. I'm coming from what I believe the community, okay, the general audience that our patients and caregivers in the home might be thinking what robots are, okay? So this was my first robot, okay? After that, I got this thing called the Omnibot, okay? Some of you might know about it, but it was my very first robot that was in the home that could move around, okay? And the Omnibot uh, actually operated with a tape cassette, okay? That's how the data was stored many years ago. If anyone had a VIC-20 or those kind of things, it would be on a tape cassette. Uh, and the Omnibot was what I got excited about in the home, okay? So I would wake up on a Saturday morning, you could program it, and I could say, good morning, Omnibot. It didn't talk back yet. And it would go all the way, you know, I could press a button and I programmed it to go from my bedroom to the kitchen, okay, so they could get my breakfast, okay. But then I'd have to yell to my mom to kind of put the cereal there. But if she wasn't there, I would have to go to the kitchen, open the fridge, get the milk, pour the cereal, go back to my room, and then have the Omnibot come back to me, okay. That was how it was years ago, okay, with, you know, just technology in the home. Eventually, um, robots, you know, we became... You know, started becoming popular in media with uh, the Transformers. Okay, you see there, uh, um, you see uh, Bumblebee there. Uh, and actually, I'm just showing off uh, here. I have the first edition of the Transformers comics. That's how nerdy I am here. Okay, so that's just something I need to let you know there that uh, I was. This is how I learned about robots, reading about it. Uh, C-3PO, R2D2, uh, those are some of the robots. Then robots started turning bad. Okay. Um, so our concept that people are afraid, some people are afraid with technology. Um, so you know who that is, the Terminator. Uh, you know, we have um, from the Borg, okay? That's uh, Jean-Luc Picard there. But, you know, who knows? Uh, right now, uh, are there robots around us? Could be, no, they could be living amongst us. We don't know, they could be. But uh, for me, in the end, when it comes to what we're talking about today in the home, Okay, it's not all that stuff I just talked about. For me, robots is simply the tools that help us get through life, okay? And that could simply be okay, a dishwasher, okay? That could be a washing machine, okay? Uh, a laundry machine, okay? They don't have eyes, they don't move, but they have robotic features, okay? That help us uh, with uh, something that Chaitali typed in earlier, activities of daily living, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, I'm sure, and uh, a toaster of it with a rotisserie, okay? Uh, something like that, instead of someone turning it, you know, all the time, that's, uh, you know, a to me, some form of robotic tool. A fan is a robotic tool, helps keep someone cool, okay? That's important in healthcare. So these are just some of the, the things that I'm looking at. And uh, one last thing we use at my, my home, uh, for my dad, we had a, a, a Hoyer lift or an assistant uh, lift, a patient lift. Okay, so that to me uh, is also considered a robot type tool. So that's how I uh, look at robotics in, in my life. And that's kind of just the warm up there, Rosalie, uh, a little history there of me there. Okay. Excellent. Some excellent everyday examples. Fantastic. Um, Milad? Yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone, uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, so I guess my exposure to robots and robotics comes from the background that as a mechanical engineer, I was always fascinated by you know, these systems. Um, and as I got into you know, a bit more of biomedical engineering, um, the interest of kind of interfacing robots with humans um, was pretty you know, fascinating. I mean, we 
had all those cartoons when you were a kid, you were watching them and you're like, well, what if this could be real? And you saw some real examples, real life examples of it. Um, and then the practicality of it came into question. Okay, well, what is truly practical? And when you think of, well, why haven't robotics and robots picked up um, as well in a kind of a metamorphosis of a human robot complex, it's because they're not designed for humans. They're designed for robots. They're designed to be robots. You know, it's just, we can do quite complex, um, you know, movements and, and, and dynamics, as you can, as you've probably seen with, you know, entities like Boston Dynamics, but that's never been translated to humans, people with disabilities um, that might need a much more, um, you know, simpler version of that to be able to, for example, stand up, um, you move their arms and, and then do simple tasks such as you know, scratching your notes, which we might take for granted um, on a daily basis. So um, now that, that I kind of got into that area of interest and I got exposed to it. And some of the work that we do at you know, the company I work at, Mayant, which involves around textiles, you might wonder, well, what's, what, how do these two interfaces kind of robotics and um, you know, assistive devices and textiles come into the equation? Well, the textile is the lining of many of these um, robotics and, and how it can connect with the body um, to capture signals, capture movements. Um, maybe it's a, you know, an EMG signal that you wish to use to elicit the movement and have it assisted. Um, maybe you need to capture pressure points on the body to prevent pressure ulcers and, 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 and other further damage that the, um, you know, the movement of the robot will be exerting on the body of the user. Um, and I guess the best, the most advanced kind of research and technology that I've seen in this area with kind of robots and humans outside of the system has been in Japan, where they're even putting tactile sensors um, in the robots uh, to understand how much pressure, how much force, how much heat, you know, even that touch of a human versus a robot um, can be translated and adjusted. So it's a, you know, it's a very fascinating world. I think there's a lot to come in, in, with the advancement of robotics and the need for um, a more um, all-encompassing healthcare system that's not limited to you know the brick and mortar of a healthcare facility, but people would be able to receive it um, at home and 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 and, and it be empowered to take control of their own healthcare and, and not always be dependent. So that's kind of where I feel robotics um, can can play a huge role and it's going to probably boom in the com coming years. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, lots and lots of um, yeah, great descriptions around um, how the interface of humans and um, technology um, can be made. So really interesting. We can dive a little bit deeper in the, into that later as well. Um, I sort of see this panel as being sort of the discussion of opportunities um, in the sense that um, in the previous panel there was a dis discussion around sort of the systemic issues that are happening now with related uh, related to adoption um, but this we're really going to be focusing on um, end users and that could be um, you know individuals who are consumers people who have disabilities older people um, people with various health care conditions um, caregivers and health care providers um, so with that context, um, just reflecting on your experiences personally um, and professionally, um, can you give us some examples of ways in which robotics has made a difference in the health or social care of people with health or um, with health problems or disabilities? Um, Ron? Yeah, so I'll go, I'll go first, sir. Uh, so the, uh, the one thing is to understand first and foremost, sometimes I like to work backwards, right? To understand what is the goal? Uh, some of you may want to take a, take a look at, you know, the perspective of begin with the end in mind. So Stephen Covey, okay? It's begin with the end in mind and reverse engineer it, okay? So many of you here as students, I think there's a good portion to have an engineering background, uh, reverse engineer it, okay? Some go the other way. You, you got to go both ways, but if you don't even understand the end piece, uh, that's a big deal. So I'm going to pick in my world, it happened to be dementia and Alzheimer's. Okay. And uh, some of that, you know, we're dealing with social isolation, we're dealing with communication challenges. So right now you're seeing me, okay, if you see me on full screen, but if you see closely, there is a robot right here beside me. Okay. And I actually don't have the batteries for it. Okay. They, they died on me. So the double D batteries for them. I uh, didn't test it out before it's going to bring some, but uh, this was gifted to me by Baycrest after I did a presentation. Um, and really all it is, is a robotic cat, okay? 
But what this does to many individuals further along, say, in their dementia, this is not for everybody. You know, you don't just say someone with dementia, you know, this is for you. People with dementia, they come from many different uh, lifestyles, different challenges, uh, you know, but there's some that will benefit from something like this, okay? And that ability to have a robotic cat, okay, to feel, okay, that moves around, it meows, it's very lifelike, okay, has done very well. And uh, even one of my neighbors here that I gave it to uh, them in my condo here, uh, uh, helped the caregiver, okay, have respite for, like he said, for about two to three hours a day, he could just leave his wife there um, and not always have to stress, okay, uh, over um, her just fidgeting and all that. So that is an example. Um, there is one that I'm gonna send you a link here that I have here. Um, one thing I like to talk about when it comes to some of these technologies uh, is how do you get something from point A to point B is what many of us try to figure out, okay? But sometimes it's how do you get something from point B to point A, okay? And for example, there's a cabinet company that's here in Ontario that I've just been chatting with that brings the cabinets towards someone. So someone who may be in a wheelchair, someone who may not be able to access something high or someone that still can access something high but may need to go on like steps, okay? One of those stools puts that person at risk, right? So uh, to me, that's still a robotic system. So I'll, I'll put the links here to some of that, but those are some of the um examples of how i look at it you know the physical a lot of this is physically related okay to me robotics is something that there's some kind of physical system that is impacting someone's life so to me i'm throwing an example of a cat and i'm throwing some phys physical furniture that i'll put in the link here in a second mm -hmm. so i mean i think that the example of the robotic cat is a fantastic example it just really illustrates that um, it actually is supporting the goals of both um, the person uh, living with dementia and the caregiver. You mentioned respite, which is so critically important um, uh, for somebody who's providing essentially 24 hour care uh, to somebody. And uh, potentially with a robotic cat, we all, you know, have a sense of, you know, pets and what they can mean to people and, you know, the comfort of um, having a um, something like um, a robotic cat around with the sort of tactile and the um, sensory experiences really can um, help to contribute to a feeling of calm, um, which often could be an issue um, in terms of um, high anxiety and um, um, agitation in some circumstances as well. So I think that, yeah, the potential of, of something like that is fantastic. Yeah. Now, just with what Milad's working on, the tactile pieces, like combining that, you know, with some of these, it's just, that's the beauty of what's possible, right? You know, so the work he's doing uh, could be like quite robotic, as you said, Milad, like, you know, robots are robots and all that stuff. But how do we make it soft so it doesn't feel like it's a robot, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, that it's something that someone can accept. That is the tricky part. It's doable, it's just a question of how can we do that. So we're going to shift over to Milad, um, thinking about how um, robotics could um, help make a difference in um, people's lives with uh, health or disabilities, health issues yeah. or disabilities. Sure. I think I'll, I'll touch up on maybe just adding to that point, the physiological benefits that some robots can provide and the psychological implications of the robots as well is very important. A good example of this, again, I, I was mentioning assistive devices for standing, for example, and they never pay really picked up. You have standing frames, for example, but um, a, a robot version of that is not necessarily there yet. There are examples of it, but this has been implemented quite readily in factories, um, automotive uh, manufacturing plants, where they use it to reduce the, basically the burden on the lower back and, and assist the stand, which is great. And, and, and you see, um, you know, it, it, it you know, providing a lot of benefit. Um, they're looking at these applications in military and soft exoskeletons now. It's becoming a kind of a concept. Um, whether it's um, you know, whether it's electronic consideration of a robotic, or some of them are even materials based, material response and provides a certain um, uh, assistance to the to the user. The other key thing is um, the adoption of these by individuals that might have a disability is, is, is critical. Um, you know, in many of the discussions that we've had, um, 
the, the users don't want to have something that will make them stand out even further, for example. And, and, and many of these robotic systems are, are quite bulky. Um, and they, you know, some, some might consider it cool, but it's not for, you know, for us as size, it's, it's, it's the user, the end user, and how they perceive it and how they would adopt it. Um, and that consideration um, really does play a role in, you know, we can potentially make a robot that will work for an individual and it will be perfect by our view as an engineer and it will do everything, you know, without error. <laughs> But at the end of the day, when you put it in front of the user, a lot of those considerations for them to adopt it might not have been in there. So I think in the design process, it's very important to, you know, as, as you fact check and as you constantly iterate on your engineering design plan and how you envision the robot functioning, but also look at the use implications of it and how the users might um, digest it and, 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 and adopt it. Because ultimately, um, many of these areas are quite niche. Um, and um, it's important to be, you know, to, 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 to limit iterations in the sense of, you know, not being so broad uh, and allowing the user to dictate where the direction is rather than what the internal kind of thoughts about it are. Mm -hmm. So, Milad, you've touched on several points that um, might be related to the second or the next question as well, okay. but um, no, ab absolutely fine. I, th I think that's fantastic. Some really, really great examples there. And I, I think um, just, you know, going back to um, Ron's point um, and also with Milad's point with um, sort of physical mobility kinds of concerns with, you know, the making the environment accessible. So the example with the cabinets um, and also with the mobility aids, um, um, just looking at, you know, the, the opportunities and possibilities that robotics can have in terms of making um, both the environment um, easily accessible for somebody who may have some mobility issues, but also to like physically uh, facilitate their mobility within that environment. And so I think there's yeah, in, in terms of, you know, what possibilities there could be with robotics for, you know, uh, creating more independence or assisting with independence, I think it's it's um, those are some really excellent examples. Um, so I'm going to shift um, into the next uh, question is looking at um, so when we're looking at applications for robotics in health and social care, um, understanding the needs and preferences and the goals and environments of our users, um, consumers, or um, however you want to, to call them, um, is absolutely critical. And um, Milad had uh, touched on some of these um, mechanisms already, but can you describe some of the strategies that you or your organizations um, use to find out information about users or customers um, that you can use to best to create solutions for them. And so I'll start with Ron. Okay. So this actually uh, relates to, I just saw the comment from Katie there, you know, and she's commenting, you know, it seems that engineers do not spend much time having discussions with end users, right? Uh, it's great to hear that, you know, we're passionate about this. So, uh, you know, one of the things I talk about is, yes, yeah, simply having that conversation, that's the start, okay? You know, like, and Milad was just talking about that. You have to understand the end users. Uh, and part of that means getting them to the table. Okay, bringing them to the table, inviting them to the table is one of the things I always talk about, but that's me. It's a question of you as engineers, as students, um, you know, to have them at the table, but also have other players at the table. Okay? Don't just have engineer, 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 engineer. Let's, and I'm just picking on that crowd because I also have a coming from that engineering background, but engineer healthcare worker or healthcare provider, okay, the community provider. Okay, the patient, the caregiver, they should be at the table, okay, you know, throughout here and there. So you have to have that mix, okay. Um, but what I, so one thing I want to throw out, one of the strategies I talk about are the, and this doesn't apply just to the word I'm going to use here. I use, I talk about the calculating caregiver, okay, but this is also the calculating patient or the person you're caring for. And I talked about that all of us are calculating, okay, you know, if you're going to give us a technology, okay, a solution, okay, we're calculating what is the return for us? Okay, what's in it for us? Okay, what am I going to get out of this? Okay, and okay, it's not just something that you know has lights and whistles, you know, and looks fancy. That's cool. Okay, that's not what we're looking for always. Okay, but to understand that calculating, and I'm going to use the term caregiver here. That's the crowd I'm talking about. The calculating caregiver, and we actually consider the ROs, the returns, the return on. Okay. And if this crowd, it's a very bright crowd listening here, okay, you're, you, you can do your math, okay? I call it the return on the numbers, okay? 
that, and what are some of the return ons? Okay, so big one is the ROI. Many of you guys know what that is, the return on investment, okay? But what are the other numbers? Return on T, return on time is another big one, okay? But there's many more, okay? There's return on, let's say someone's emotion, okay? Return on their physical health, return on their quality of life, okay? It's not always about quantity of life, okay? It might be, okay, so R-O-Q-L. Uh, return on your value. So that was discussed earlier as well in the previous session, okay? Um, to justify the values of, you know, what you're giving, you know, the MVP, what's the minimal viable product or the, you know, but what's the value to that person? So all these ROs, it's tricky because there is no one algorithm. It's different for every patient and every family and every caregiver you're gonna be dealing with, okay? So, but they're all numbers, okay? Some go up, some go down. Uh, just so happens, if you ever forget this, so the return on the numbers actually spells out RON, okay? So that's just, I just use that here and there. Just have it, and that wasn't planned. It's just a return on the numbers. Hey, I'll, I'll stick that in there, okay? So what are the RONs for who you're serving, okay? So that's what I throw out to people is to understand the RONs and what they're calculating. And to figure that out, you have to have a conversation with them or you have to pull them in, okay? And the only one other point I'll talk, oh, quickly, I'll sneak this in here, Rosalie. Um, study psychographics. Okay, a lot of people don't know what that is, but I would suggest you look up psychographics, which talks about the values, opinions, beliefs. Okay, it's not simply this, this cross off a check mark that okay, dad was changed. This helps dad change. This helps dad put food on his table. It's not just that. There's more to that. You know, what are the values? What kind of food is it? Okay, um, is it something that he appreciates? Is it a cultural, you know, uh, dish that he would, uh, you know want. So look up psychographics. And my last comment here is I talk about failure. Okay. I always look at the failure point. It's many people look at all the cool stuff. This can do this and that. I say, where is it going to fail? Okay. What part does it fail in the hands of myself in the journey? Okay. In the, in the path of getting to me, okay. In policy, all that stuff you need to understand. For me, I have an acronym that I use for fail. It's whenever there's a failure point, it's an opportunity to find another important lesson, okay? So I'm always looking for that, okay? If you can answer all my failure questions, then that's a good product and solution you probably have at that point, okay? So those are some of the ways I uh, approach this. Mm -hmm. So that sounds really, really interesting. Thank you for all of the um, the tips and strategies. And um, for anybody who's thinking about, um, you know, a very holistic approach to understanding who end users are, consumers, think about Ron. <laughs> all right, Milad. Yeah, um, I'll just I'll just double down on what, what what Ron was just describing, and to take a kind of a chapter out of um, industry and in, in in a specific market research. This concept of psychographics and understanding the customer, um, you know, it, it's amazing to see how marketing is, is using this at, at length to figure out if the if the color of the packaging should be green or purple and what is the return um, on how much they can sell. But these concepts are not necessarily implemented in someone's quality of life and in, in, in the products that are necessarily being developed. So using concepts like this, um, conjoint analysis at the early stages of the development is critical. And in the, you know, the application that's coming out of this is going to be a very multidisciplinary um, effort um, to get to that point. And for that, the engagement needs to be systematically across the board and everything maturing together, where you, know, you don't go too deep into the engineering developments and you need to go back and reinvent everything and redesign everything. So, you know, we, we, we have this concept of obviously technology readiness level, which I think everyone is aware of, but actually employing that in practice is very key. And you can have a similar concept of technology readiness for the product that you're developing. How is this product going to be perceived? How is the user going to interact with it? What is the return on investment or all the other numbers that you're looking at? All the aspects and the considerations and what are the different, um, I guess, the spectrum of the individuals that will be using this. So as, as an individual that's going into building, let's say a, the next big startup um, for robotics, you know, uh, the, the shimmer of a, of a shiny startup that's coming out of San Francisco in and out strategy um, is not a sustainable, um, you know, for the user, for the end, for the end user. So it, it's a bit more valuable if 
you know, it would be a more organic and, and, and well-founded base to build from, because then in itself, it will grow and it will bring out all the other possibilities that can be realized. So yeah, I think just a comprehensive overview of the development cycle and figuring out what are the areas that need to be focused on. So then at that point, you can figure out that ROI, what amount of technology funding and time does it need to go through and where is the lowest hanging fruit per se to get you know the first product out and that should be the key thing to get the first unit out for testing for validation because at that point then you start learning where all our assumptions correct or wrong um, so spending too much time in the early trls you know this concept that concept at a certain point you need to cut and say okay this is what we're going with so um yeah that, that's just kind of my input on the development of these robotic technologies rosalie can i ask Milad a question Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so I'm loving where you're going there, Milad, because I, I also love the lowest hanging fruit. If you don't understand the lowest hanging fruit, okay, um, you know, I don't know who you're solving for, then you really don't understand. Uh, but all the stuff that you just shared, you know, and there's a lot of students here, okay. When did you learn this? Okay, like, you know, like this is the, like, did you learn this after schooling, during schooling? Like, because here they are at school, are they going to hear this or do you have to experience it? I'm just curious when you really got it. For me, it was honestly a matter of experience. And the, the thing is, you get exposed to a lot of these concepts here and there, and you hear it here, you hear it there, and you're like, well, well so what? And, and so what to the beauty where you don't, I, I couldn't grasp how, I, how is this applicable or how I can I use this and, and apply it in daily practice. But as you, know, you gain experience and you go deeper into the developments, you realize that these concepts give a framework um, where, you know, <laughs> the whole thing won't be a house of cars and just falling on itself with one piece of the equation fails. At least there's that framework where you can kind of like, who wants to be a millionaire? You're not going to go lower than that. You already have a strong base and foundation to build from. So you're reducing your risk and it's a risk mitigation strategy and um, aiming you know, for success. You know, I guess in university, you're always waiting for deadline day to, to hand it in and just to get the grade and go out. But in, 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 in practice, that deadline day is the next iteration and the next and you're ultimately have to have a solution for the user. So it becomes, you know, truly application, you know, applied science where the application is, is the key. And that's kind of where, you know, I, I kind of had to employ them on a daily basis. Hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No, the applied part is, uh, is challenging if you haven't, if you're not part of that, if you're still that student going through mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yeah. But if you're really, really hear clearly from what Milad is saying, what I'm sharing and others are sharing, it's, we are talking to you about failures in a different way, you know, and hopefully your failures, you know, are not as big, okay, um, or not as many, but you will have them. Just be aware, you're gonna have them. We're all gonna have it. Just uh, can it be much smaller? Uh, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rosalie. Yeah, so I, this is this is fantastic. So I'm what I'm hearing is that um, there there's I I think there's um, a lot of sort of differences in how potentially work in academia um, is operating and work in industry in real life and real life I mean industry but also in the real life sort of uh, care settings um, uh, where you know people who are living with disabilities or have health problems um, and the caregivers providing that support uh, for them. There's often, you know, potentially a, a mismatch in what happens in academia where we spend a lot of time um, trying to work out a lot of details about our intervention but once it sort of you know gets into a real life setting there's a lot of work that needs to be done lots of sort of revision updating um, maybe your initial course was just way off base and once you get the feedback from the other stakeholders um, including people in industry what potentially could be a marketable product or a sellable product um, um, really you know goes back into the fold and lots of iterations sort of need to be made we we can call them you know failures um, but we can yeah again as Ron said potentially um, opportunities to improve and improve and improve so um, we're going to shift gears a little bit and just you know in a you know one sentence or two sentences um, let me know what you think are some are the grand challenges in the application of robotics for health or social care. Okay. 
I'll go first. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one or two. For me, it's about knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization piece. Okay. Uh, going specifically, usually from ac academia and research, okay, to the real world. <laughs> okay. That I believe there's a gap of how you can communicate that better. So that's probably the big one I'm thinking of. Uh, and I'm actually giving a solution as well. I also believe that there has to be some kind of cross pollinate pollinating of of different disciplines. Like in, having an occupational therapist. Okay understand technology, okay? You know, like technology, solving for technology, okay? Just putting that crowd together as an example. So that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I went over two sentences, but. That's okay, that's <laughs> okay. All right, you go ahead, Milad. Yeah, you took them away from me. I was gonna say knowledge translation as well, which ah. is key and obviously multidisciplinary. That's another key thing, you know, yeah. in, in engineering departments, everyone, your department of mechanical engineering, department of electrical engineering, it doesn't show not even interdepartmental in engineering, but outside, like you said, with working with clinicians, uh, working with people that interact with the patients on a daily basis, or even working with different modalities of manufacturing and that knowledge. But I suppose just to add my, my one word after all that sentence too, it's adoption. Um, knowledge translation is key. Um, and, and that's kind of one thing that would be huge if academia can, can, can ramp it up and, and allow these ideas that are you know, brewing from the universities to come out. Um, but then, how can we get them adopted? How, and, and that adoption in itself uh, forces us to think for quality of life improvements for the end user. So yeah, for me, it would be adoption. R Rosie, I need to do a plug here for uh, someone in the chat here, okay? Um, yeah. and, and, and that's Chaitalia, I mentioned her name earlier, okay? Yes. So Chaitalia actually is a part of AgeWell. So I co-chair AgeWell's Older Adult and Caregiver Advisory Committee. And Chaitalia has an engineering background, works in healthcare and also you know, was a caregiver to her mom, okay? So wearing all those hats, okay, that's gold in my opinion, right? So sometimes finding those that are in your discipline but also are living it, okay? You know, that's where you, they'll, they'll be able to understand at a very different level, okay? So that, I just wanted to throw in Chaitel because she's sharing her story here. And uh, there's many out there, they just, you know, you don't, they're in your class, they're, they're your neighbors, they're, they work with you, right? So uh, just pulling out that story. Um, so thanks, Chaitali, I had to put that in there because it's related to what we're talking about. Like she can help with that knowledge translation, mobilization, that adoption piece. She knows the words from both sides, the language, the pain point. Yes, I appreciate Shatali very much. <laughs> She's also volunteering with our lab. So oh, really, is she? Really, oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> you know that? Okay. Yeah, brilliant. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, I'm gonna, um, I'm, I'm really, really pleased that there's so much convergence in the sort of, um, you know, the grand challenges that you've presented. Um, so looking at knowledge translation and um, yeah, absolute critical areas and also the um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary, however you would like to, to frame it, um, the degree of integration of all of the disciplines and also uh, sectors as well. So academia and um, industry and, you know, advocacy, um, all of that is, um, all of those disciplines and sectors are really, really critical to um, being able to actually transition um, some of the wow. development in robotics into actual real life applications and for adoption. So um, yeah, really interesting. So um, looking, I've got the final question here before we sort of open it up to um, the uh, audience uh, for some additional questions and I'll have a look at the chat as well. Um, what do you think are the greatest opportunities right now? And so um, what should we really, really be focusing on right now to benefit uh, people with health problems or disabilities? Like if we miss this opportunity now, um, you know, there potentially could be great detriments. So uh, Ron, what do you think? Uh, okay, so now I've always gone first before Milad. I, I wasn't sure if you wanted him to go first. Just, okay, I'll, I'll go. So for me, um, it was talked about a little bit earlier about the remote piece. Um, uh, I'm interested in telepresent robots or tele telepresent kind of technologies or remote technologies. I was doing that even eight, nine years ago. with My dad, okay, caring remotely. Um, so what could that be? It doesn't have to be that robot, you know, that's like an Android that has a face as I, you know, it could be you know, stuff that Milad's doing, but remote, okay, you know, that ability that I could get the, the results remotely. 
I'd love VR or some kind of uh, augmented reality where I could help uh, with the robot make a meal for my dad, okay, if no one is around, or open the fridge or you know something remotely that I could do that. It's there, it's just passing it on in the care space. I, since I got this moment here, I just say, if anyone's doing work in that around the kitchen or the bathroom, that's, if we're talking about in the home, those are the two toughest places okay, to care for, for the most part, in, in my opinion, okay? So many failure points in those places. If you're doing anything in that space, give me a shout because I'm always trying to find solutions around that, especially remote as well. So that's where I'd be you know, putting my interest in you. Okay, telepresence robots, excellent. Okay, Malad? And I think I think um, it's in the same light. Um, the, the, the opportunity that's presented to us right now, especially with the pandemic, is, is um, uh, remote healthcare um, as as a whole, and, and, and robotics plays one one you know piece of the puzzle. Um, but the ability to provide healthcare in an equitable, um, efficient um, uh, manner, uh, not just locally but globally. Um, has become even ever more needed as a result of the pandemic. Um, and some of the work that we're doing at Mayant um, through textiles, because everyone wears clothing, um, is allowing for this to happen. Um, so being able to create this. Oh, Malad muted yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, this concept has been kind of presented. Again, I, I go back to uh, the Japanese um, model it's a, it's a concept called Society 5.0, where we have a lot of connectivity. And now with 5G and the, 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 the immense ability to transfer and send data in real time, so things can be um, effectual in real time, not just sending data and saying, hey, you have a Fitbit, you look at the data, so what? What is, what is the point of that? But to have meaningful and actionable outcomes for the user and enabling the users to have that, as well as with that data stream being present, anyone remotely can you know, tap in and support their parents, their grandparents, or loved one, wherever they have um, around the world. That is, that is a huge opportunity, and I'm really looking forward to it because that will really shift um, a lot of um, the plays in society. Uh, I was listening to just a documentary on the weekend um, on CBC talking about individuals with disabilities, how ever since COVID, their surgeries have been delayed, and they just look at the age, they don't look at the consideration of disability and how that affects their quality of life. And in that period, there is no monitoring, there is no support above and beyond what they need. So, and these systems and the technologies are there. If it's there for you to turn on your lamps remotely or to, you know, play a TV show, <laughs> what it is, again, the implications of it for improvements in quality of life are definitely much grander. The ROI is definitely bigger. Um, so we need to play an active role in, in, in pushing those. It might not seem you know, sexy by venture capitalists, but once they see the dollars and cents when it goes to insurance and, and healthcare funding, then a slew of the money will come. So we just need to make it, that translation of technology more viable and, and realizable for, for all the funds to switch um, into this field. Mm -hmm. Thank I you. just want to back up, Milad, just on the diversity, the equity piece, like, yeah, that is huge with technology because there's a concern of the digital divide. Okay, the has and the have nots, especially now. Um, so, uh, and the only other thing to add is uh, for people if they're interested is uh, some of you in our space know the social determinants of health, okay? The, that's piece, but the digital determinants of health is becoming a bigger piece that, you no, know, if you don't have access to technology that could affect your health. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just something to be aware of. Um, my last ask, Rosalie, just if anyone's doing work back in the kitchen that gets food from the freezer to the oven to the to, you know to the person, that's the one I'm hitting up uh, a lot of walls recently. Okay, from family. So, so I'm just throwing that out to this crowd. Okay? <laughs> so and, and anybody, anyone students who want to work on a new project, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So. I wanted actually to say thank you to Milad for um, raising the issue of equity because whenever we are talking about technology, um, we always have questions of who's paying for it, who will have access, does it increase the divide between people who are able to afford technologies um, and people who um, are needing to live without the, techno um, the benefits of potential technologies. So. Um, very, very critical questions when we think about um, adoption and translation, um, thinking about, you know, the, the 
piece around how do we make things so that they're accessible for people, but also having policies that would support access um, and don't create unnecessary barriers for people to maximally benefit. So excellent. Um, we've got quite a few comments in the chat, which is fantastic. Um, keep the chat comments coming. I'm going to scan for some questions. And while you're doing that, Rotate, I need to do one more comment that we haven't talked about. It's yes. just the trust around technology. Okay? Mm -hmm. There is that piece that you also have to build the trust for, like that we don't trust technology, okay? or many. Okay? I, I'm an early adopter, many. But that trust, the privacy piece, okay? Okay, you know, where's the data going? Who's holding it? We didn't discuss that today, but that is just something to keep in mind as well with your technology. Absolutely. So there's some great discussion here about caregiving um, with robots. Um, okay, so, and some kudos for interdisciplinarity. All right. See some questions from Aaron. She saw that. Yes, so Aaron. Okay, huh. okay, so a question from Aaron. Um, clinical studies with new technologies often suffer from not being able to recruit enough participants to get significant results. Have you found some techniques to create barrier free recruitment through the technology design process? In particular, are there some techniques you use to probe users for insight on their needs before having a functional prototype? And then there's another question after that, but let's um, have a look at that first. Um, and Ron and Malad, feel free to jump in. Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe take, jump in on this. Um, so um, it's a, this is a very, um, I guess, focused question on basically how do you make it happen? Um, and um, to that point, there obviously is a need for study, well, there's a necessity of having an ethics th disclosure or um, ethics board clearance when you want to do a study. I suppose for some of the initial ass assessments of what the user needs, so you don't need a, a broad disclosure or ethics document. You can have a very simplistic one where you're just assessing their needs and having interviews with them. So focus groups or just regular surveys, you can send those out. Best best piece of kind of information, you know, is a literature review of you. If you have those documents that have all the previous studies, you can find a big chunk of the data there. But the other key thing is, as you're developing these technologies, you have to have one eye, uh, and no one tells you this in school or anywhere, on what are the regulations? Um, what is the class one? What is the class two? What is the class three? What is the need for developing a class one, two, or three device? Um, you know, how is the development cycle and how is the documentation that you need it? And it's kind of, you know, when you reach a certain point and you're not aware of this, then you look at it then, you thought you're over the hill and then you realize, oh my God, there's another massive mountain ahead, which is regulatory. Um, and it is very tedious and backfilling of these documents is it's definitely not advised, but at that point you would have to do it, which is you will go in a, in a spiral. So understanding where you fall on the regulatory claim um, and deciding your strategy based off of that. For example, you're mentioning electric stimulation. Is this electric stimulation a device which is going to be um, something that the individual's life depends on it? Or is it something that's assistive and their life doesn't depend on it? The class two and the class three variation is huge in the amount of work and the um, validations that you would need to take. So I, as much as I hate to say it, the technology translation is dead on arrival or right off the bat when you want to get into it if you're going for class three. You have to phase things in. And second, looking at predicate devices. What has been there before previously so you can build off of that foundation? Um, those could really assist and support um, because there is a fair bit of information previously done and that's kind of what we kind of conveniently use the word technology translation um, because we're not trying to create something from scratch. Um, but in the process of translating technology, you will come up with new opportunities and from that foundation that you've translated, you can introduce the new technologies. So, um, just a sorry, quick question for um, the hero curriculum developers um, out there. Uh, are, is there content uh, for the students related to regulatory processes in the curriculum? Or might that be something we need to embed? Just asking out into the 
Zoom world out there. Um, anyway, anybody has a response, they can put it in the chat. Uh, Ron, you had a comment. Yeah, yeah on this error, on Aaron's comment, I, I interpret the question as recruitment, okay? Uh, recruitment of participants uh, earlier on. Uh, my answer, pay them, give them money. That's, a, that's the obvious answer, okay? If you give something to someone that they'll say, okay, I'm gonna show up, you know, here you go, here's a thousand bucks to show up. They'll come, okay, but that's probably not the route we're going, okay. But I'm just giving you my quick, smart ass answer that I'm giving you. But the right now, I'm going to let you know, recruitment is tough in every area, okay. Um, and to make it around, you know, especially with COVID, okay. Technically, those that you have to access, you know, if you're recruiting patients and caregivers or whoever, you know, you have to do it through technology, and you already have lost the crowd. Those that don't have technology, so if that's the way, that's just the game right now. Okay. Unless you're boots on the ground, you're knocking on people's door, which you can't do, you're not going to hit everybody. So it's not easy. Um, can you offer an incentive? That's what I always look at. Like, what do they want? You know, understanding the lowest hanging fruit as well. And then the other route sometimes is you got to throw out something to them. Okay. Sometimes it's not about just, okay, tell us, tell us, tell us. You know, as much as I suggested that earlier, we were talking about that. Sometimes you got to do the Steve Jobs approach thing. They're going to want, you know, this little thing that has a thousand songs, okay? Even though people don't know what it is. You just throw it out there. We have this. And you got to just say, this is what we have. You know, try and find that early adopter. Say, you want this, right? And if they say, no, we don't, or yes, we do, then you go from there, okay? That's, that's kind of one angle of doing it. Sometimes you got to just be blunt and say, this is what we're going with, and this is what we're pursuing, okay? And we know that we think you're the ideal patient or caregiver that wants this. Give us feedback. And they'll tell you right there. Okay, so that's a different perspective altogether. That's my. Mm. I'm going to put in a plug. Being a former person in the REB for Toronto Rehab, um, in terms of paying participants, mm. I absolutely agree. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There needs to be a compensation component to it, and I think a lot of times we are looking at um, trying as best we can to provide um, some offset for their transportation to get there, because that is often quite a big barrier. And if somebody is needing to take a taxi or a wheelchair um, a taxi for every appointment, it, the the cost can really, really build up. Um, but in terms of paying our participants, um, I think we, we do need to provide some kind of a, um, like an honorarium or compensation related, related to that to uh, make sure that we are indicating that we are fully, fully valuing the time and contribution that they're uh, putting into it. So um, there are quite a few comments in the chat, which is fantastic. So we have... Um, Okay, there's a comment about, uh, hopefully, uh, Aaron, we've answered your question here. Um, okay, completely agree with the trust and adoption of technology in our collaboration with medical specialists. Um, um, okay, the question is, do you have to address these concerns in your own research or work? And have you, do you have, um, how would you approach if you haven't? So in terms of addressing uh, trust and adoption of technology um, being replaced by robots. Right. So that's a great point, actually, because we, we, we actually had a discussion about this um, with a lot of um, physicians because um, they are the number one adopters of our technology in the sense of the end um, use of it. Technology is coming their way and, and, and doctors are pretty intelligent and everybody is aware of what's happening. The key thing is to make sure that it doesn't create an if it's not taking away a step for them it doesn't create an extra step for them um you know making sure that it is compatible with whatever codes they need to use for billing um and that the data that they're you know you're providing them or assessing or however your the system is interpreting and, and providing feedback is applicable to them within the realms that's been defined to them again it go, a lot of it goes to policy and for policy to accept and adopt it the trust of it, all these things come in and things are adapting. For example, there was a HIPAA compliance, holistic healthcare. Now there's a P-HIPAA, personalized HIPAA, where an individual can choose how much of their data they want to give versus one, one size fits all kind of regulations that were existing. So again, the regulations and the regulatory will change, um, but you can't wait for that to happen. It's kind of a chicken and egg type of thing. And I think in this case, building the technology, putting it out there, the kind of the Steve Jobs kind of example, Make, putting it ever present in front of people so they see the value, things will shift immediately 
um, towards what is progress and what is sensible. Um, so yeah, I suppose that, that that's kind of how the shift should occur. Mm -hmm. Leslie, just one little comment on that. And this is not really answering the question, but um, just an area that I see that we have a lot of work, all of us, uh, is that path from the healthcare physician to the patient that there's no, the supports are very weak. Like who is the geek squad right there, okay? So should the patient be calling, I do a lot of work on virtual care here with Ontario Health Teams. Should it be the patient calling the doctor, uh, doc, um, I'm stuck with my password, right? No, or I can't log in. No, is it the front desk person there? Like that's it, just throwing that out. Um, not really answering the question, but I just want to address that that's one area as, you know, Mlad says, we don't want the doctor having extra work, you know, on, on the technology side of things. That's not really their role, but uh, we're missing that whole area. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think it does tie into um, some of this, um, all, all of the discussion around integration, um, because um, you don't want something that's going to come in and take over your job, but you also want it to be um, contributing to how you're able to practice and that you can see that the value in it is that it's going to help you with your job and um, having that um, uh, support and sort of ease of transition really, really does help to sort of um, encourage the buy-in where it's like, it's not causing me more trouble, but it's actually helping me to do the best job that I can. Yeah. So very encouraging. Uh, there's a lot of conversation here about, yes, there will be some regulatory content and IP co-design. That's fantastic. Oh, and Kimberly is working with Health Canada to look at uh, a talk related to that. So that's fantastic. Um, uh, it's hard for people interested in participating on projects to hear about available projects. Um, maybe a better place or platform to connect researchers with participants um, and partners. Um, excellent, excellent point, because there is a community of people out there who wants to be able to engage in research and to learn and to be able to participate. Um, I'll just make a comment on that there. Uh, and that's Mary uh, Wang. Um, so I know her, she's also a caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting better. Okay. So if I'm just looking at the past, from the past five years, I do a lot of work with patient engagement. Um, it is getting better. Like again, age well, many of you know age well, um, uh, that part of that is ha having, you know, us at the tables. So are we there? No, we're not there yet, you know, but uh, we're getting there. You know, we're making dents. All right, so got a message here to wrap up from uh, Kimberly, which I was going to actually just ask if we have any other time, but it's 1145 now. So um, I would like to thank Ron and Milad uh, for participating in this panel and uh, for offering all of their insights um, for us and the participants and especially the students out there who are um, really, really craving the knowledge um, from the community and um, from industry as well. So really, really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. And um, I think as Anamesh said earlier, if you are able to um, jump in for the um, networking session, that would be amazing. Um, we can answer some questions there as well. So back to Kimberly. Great, thank you so much. Um, Rosalie, Ron and Malab, I wanna add my thanks. And also uh, in particular, just say, we didn't plan in advance for any MIE 1080 students out there. All the things that they said that are very relevant and pertinent to the lectures that you've been hearing, that's just because it's true. So <laughs> thanks guys for making us look good.